everybody. It's John Lodra here from New Harbor Financial for our weekly uh, video update. It is Thursday, the 24th of August, uh, getting late in the summer. Um, time is flying. Uh, we've had a busy week in the office this week, as, as many weeks are. Um, so I'm actually recording this video at home, uh, just sneaking it in here around the fringes. Um, uh, I want to keep it uh, focused on some some high level things. Um, you know, there's some important meetings, uh, headline grabbing meetings this week, um, and of course some headline grabbing uh, news and markets. And I'll just touch upon those and and bring it of of course uh, back to uh, you, our clients, and your accounts, and and um, what we're what we're observing and what we're doing. Um, so first big meeting this week is the meeting of. The Federal Reserve in Jackson Hole. This is an annual meeting. It always happens in the late summer in beautiful Jackson Hole. Um, and of course, uh, the last decade or more has been just pretty much all about the Fed. So these meetings are very closely watched. Of course, uh, things coming out of this these meetings uh, tend to be clues or uh, um, hints at, at where interest rate policy and monetary policy is likely to go near and longer term. So. Uh, the world will be watching uh, the news coming out of that meeting. Uh, there's also a meeting of the BRICS countries this week uh, in Johannesburg, and there's some news coming out of that. And of course, some headlines in the, in the market. So the Jackson Hole meeting, uh, again, really is really about interest rates. And um, I'm going to piggyback on uh, the weekly update that that Mike Preston did um, last week. Hopefully you all saw that. And and he talked a lot about interest rates and, and where they are, where they maybe are going. And um, uh, kind of how they might impact um, certain aspects of our clients' portfolios. So I'd like to just give a quick update. So uh, we have in recent, um, so of, of course, the short-term interest rates that the Federal Reserve set has have, have been rising pretty steadily over the last year or so, year and a half, actually. Uh, and, um, you know, the, uh, went from about zero, actually zero for much of the last decade to the target federal, federal funds uh, rate right now is... Uh, 5.25 to 5.5. So this sets the rates for things like treasury bills and many money market accounts. Uh, many bank savings accounts have uh, not kept pace by any, uh, by even close a measure uh, to what the uh, rates on th things like short-term T-bills have done. So um, of course we hold a, a pretty um, substantial allocation to short-term T-bills in, in client accounts uh, for their safety and for their cu current yield. Um, you know, we can look at uh, market implied expectations um, as to what, if any, future uh, rate increases or decreases, for that matter, uh, might come out of upcoming Fed meetings. Uh, their their month their their regular um, FOMC meetings, as they're called, uh, are scheduled to be in September and November. So uh, the market is actually pricing in very low probability of a of a, a further increase. Um, at the uh, September meeting, it's about a 13% probability that the market is pricing in that the Fed may raise rates another quarter percentage point at the September meeting. Uh, by the November meeting, the market is pricing in about a 38% probability. So, um, and and but most of the weight of probability is that they'll stay pat at the the current uh, 5.25 to 5.5 target uh, rate. Um, and uh, you know we'll see. Obviously, we'll, uh, so so we think, and uh, it's probably likely that we're in kind of a, in a holding pattern here for some time on on the um, short term rates. We don't expect the the Fed to start to to, to drop interest rates uh, in the short term uh, on short term rates anytime soon. We think there would have to be some pretty um, dramatic sell offs in financial markets or distress in financial markets for for that to happen. Um, so we'll we'll obviously watch that. Um, turning to long-term rates, uh, long-term rates have spiked up uh, pretty dramatically over the last uh, several weeks and months. And um, the 10-year Treasury bond, for example, um, got as high as um, uh, almost 4.37% uh, 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 in, in the last uh, handful of, of days. Um, and this com contrasts with a low of remarkably 0.4% uh, or, or thereabouts. It touched briefly about 4.4% in the the, the panic sell-off of the stock market in March of 2020 uh, when COVID hit. So pretty dramatic move from 0.4 to, to uh, almost 4.4. I'm going to share a chart here just to kind of look at the short-term action in, in those 10-year Treasury bonds uh, interest rates. And that's what this chart is. Uh, it's a daily chart of the 10-year Treasury yield. And you can see it spiked up here again, uh, just under 4.37. 
And what we saw yesterday actually was a pretty, pretty large sell off uh, in that interest rates um, got down to about 4.2. Um, so a pretty dramatic uh, sell off the last day or so. It very well might be a, a reversal of sorts that we might see those rates come down maybe closer to four. It's been hugging this this line here is what we call a Bollinger Band. It's a two standard deviation measure above the 50 day moving average. It's not uncommon for when that Bollinger Band is hit for, for these rates to pull back. So we may see that. The upshot of that is we do have a holding in longer term treasury bonds. That's a tactical holding that has, has struggled lately. And Mike talked about it last week. But we uh, do have hedges in place that have basically taken much of the risk of, of that position off the table. But we did see uh, a very large bounce yesterday in this is TLT, which is an ETF that holds 20 plus year treasury bonds. So we saw a very large bounce from about 92 and change to 95 and change um, in over 3% move uh, on, on the day. And just a reminder, uh, we do have put option protection that basically has effectively sold half of our position in that at, at a price of 98. So this recent decline here for half of the position in, in most of our client accounts has been pretty much neutered uh, by that protection. So we, we think there's quite likely a bounce in the near term further to the upside that could take things closer to 100 here where where that prior level of support was. And just just kind of changing to another view here. It's not uncommon for TLT to, to see uh, pretty dramatic uh, monthly moves. And, and that's what this chart here is. This basically shows the one month price returns of TLT rolling one month returns. And you can see here, you know, the last month or so, we had a pretty big sell off, uh, I think about 9%. And then yesterday's bounce brought it up to about 6% uh, sell off. But if you go back over history here, this goes back to, I think, 2002, it's not uncommon for us to see very sharp subsequent follow through on the monthly returns when when you get a, a, a punch down like this. And of course, there are times where we absolutely see a, a massive spike higher, for example, in risk off sell offs. This, is, this goes back to the housing bust here. Uh, we look at the spike here uh, in COVID, you know, even later last year, later 22, we had a, a monthly spike in returns just shy of 15%. So we'll be watching for that. The bottom line is we have very little exposure there. Um, and you know, we think if there is follow through, it certainly will help client accounts um, uh, on the upside. Um, you know, of course, interest rates um, not only affect the, the bond market, but they're actually a very key determinant of stock market returns, at least over the long term. And we've talked about this before, but I'll, I'll mention it again. Um, you know, when interest rates get higher on things like bonds, the relative attractiveness of, of stocks becomes that much less attractive because you can get a um, you know, a competitive return on a very safe and guaranteed instrument if you hold it to maturity. So right now, um, you know, we think in, in fact data that we can look at, you know, paints a very unlikely picture that we get 10 year returns from current levels in say the S&P 500 that comes anywhere close to the 4.2, 4.3-ish uh, type uh, guaranteed returns that one can get in uh, treasury bonds if if you were to hold the treasury bond to maturity and that's not what we're we're, we're recommending we do think there will be a, a bounce in in longer term treasury bonds in the next uh you know few months to maybe a year or two uh but a longer term we think uh, the bond market is going to be pretty challenged especially if we see a um you know sustained higher inflationary environment and things like that with fiscal deficits but um if you look at the um the dividend yield on global stocks and compare it to the the bond yield uh, on global bonds, um, we have quite a remarkable um, divergence going on here. I'm going to share another chart here to, to point that out. Going back to, uh, I don't know, 2006, 2007. And what you see, see here is uh, the black line here in the top panel is the, the aggregate yield to, uh, in the global bond index. You can see we had a very big spike uh, up here in yields uh, on, on a global basis, you know, around 4%. Uh, what you see here in the red line is the the dividend yield on on the world the global stock market index, and for much of the past bunch of years, the the yield on stocks has been greater than yield on bonds. But we've seen a remarkable divergence here, and this lower panel basically shows that that spread. In other words, uh, not since two thousand eight have we seen global bond yields exceed the global stock yields to the degree that we now do. And this is not so much a full-on endorsement that that bonds are a great investment. It's
frankly, more a reflection of how overvalued stocks have become and how risky, uh, broadly speaking, stocks are from these current levels uh, because of their massively high valuations. You know, when you when you take the valuation of stocks up, the dividend yield goes down and vice versa. So just uh, something I want to share there just to kind of put put that in context. You know, so um, if we look at, um, you know, interest rates and their impact on other areas of, of markets, um, one area that is very uh, important to our clients is, is the housing market. Um, obviously, many of our clients own homes or are looking to purchase homes or, or make moves. But the housing market has been really, um, really challenged um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but uh, the interest rate market has, has certainly um, com complicated that. Um, if we look at the housing activity, uh, existing home sales have, have fallen off a cliff. There's just not much activity. Uh, new home sales have, have actually been robust because there is so little activity in existing home sales that home builders have had to uh, massively discount prices and um, even subsidize mortgages to get uh, buyers to buy new homes. So it's really been a, a distorted market. And, and of course, housing prices have gone through the roof um, in, in the wake of the COVID stimulus and crazy, crazy unaffordability. And we think something's bound to break there. Um, in the form of prices coming down and ultimately uh, mortgage rates coming down. But if we look at a chart right now of um, you know, the 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 at, uh, average uh, mortgage rate hit about seven three seven point three percent on thirty year mortgage. If you see here seven seven point three one percent, and mortgage applications have just absolutely fallen off the cliff here. Going back all the way to 1995 is the last time we've seen the, the activity this this low. So pretty dramatic drop off there. And one big reason for this is if, if you look at the average mortgage, um, many people were able to lock in mortgages uh, down in the 3% range. And if you compare that to where mortgages are right now, uh, there's basically a bunch of trapped homeowners where even if they wanted to sell, they feel trapped and understandably so because they would be giving up a very uh, low average mortgage, uh, again, about 3.6% on average across the country to only trade up to a much higher mortgage. So that that is really a key factor that has frozen the housing market. And without activity, the true price discovery of, of homes uh, really isn't happening. So we expect eventually the housing market to come off pretty pretty substantially, but it's really frozen for the for the moment. So turning to the BRICS meeting, um, not a whole lot to say there other than uh, it's a it's a big, big long term trend that uh, the BRICS stands for um, uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China and, and several other countries. In fact, one of the newsworthy items coming out of the meeting this week. Um, well, first of all, the meeting was really meant to, to um, uh, put further foundation on on the development of an alternative global trade currency to assess, essentially push back against the dollar's dominance. Um, some of these countries have uh, been exploring ways to uh, exchange trade in 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 uh, their own currencies, but this 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 meeting was meant to establish the foundation, further establish the foundation for a BRICS currency where these countries can can trade in this currency. And the notion is that that currency would be commodity backed, probably um, fixed to a uh, a fixed weight of gold. Um, so a, a real found currency, you might say, at least the, the attempt to be. But uh, new, newsworthy, I think, coming out of the meeting is um, invitations have been extended to uh, a handful of other countries to join the, that, that collaboration. Uh, those countries are Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, Argentina, Egypt, and Ethiopia. Um, pretty interesting collection of countries. Obviously, you have some, some big oil producing countries there, which is a huge factor and and this may be as important geopolitically as it is from a, a global currency and, and trade standpoint um but uh, obviously that's something that will take we think probably years to play out but it is an, an important thing to keep an eye on here as it relates to um you know basically the the future ahead so the last thing i want to touch upon is um you know we had a big earnings uh, announcement by a a very highly followed um uh, stock uh, Nvidia, which is a um, semiconductor company, and it is it is one of a handful of seven stocks, the magnificent seven or so, that have uh, you know basically accounted for a, a substantial portion of the year-to-date 
uh, gains in the S and P 500. Excuse me, S and P 500. Um, Nvidia came out with a, a massively um, uh, strong earnings uh, projection and uh, basically blew away estimates. Um, and the stock uh, has uh, responded quite substantially over at least uh, in, in the after hours. I'll share a chart just to show what that looks like. Here's the after hours. We the market closed. Uh, Nvidia closed yesterday at like 470 ish, 471, I think, a share popped up as high as 520, and now it's trading pre-market <clears throat> uh, closer to 502. Um, massive, massive um, pop higher. Um, if we zoom out and look at a monthly chart, this is what that stock has done over the last 20 years. This is basically the last year right here, to, uh, to 2023, October 2022 to, to, to current day. What a massive spike. And I can't help but draw parallels to some of the stocks in the internet bubble meme of the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Um, you know, basically, NVIDIA, obviously, the, the, the franchise looks very strong. Uh, you know, whether the growth rates can sustain themselves, uh, we will see. But oftentimes, you have stock prices that get way ahead of the um, fundamentals of a stock, even, even a very strongly growing and fast growing company like NVIDIA. And one example of perhaps a, an analog to this uh, is what Cisco did in the um, lead up to the tech bubble of, of internet bubble of 2000. I'm gonna share a chart of what uh, Cisco did just to kind of put things in context here. So here's a uh, chart of, of Cisco. You have the stock price in blue and the trailing 12 month revenues in orange. So you can see obviously a huge ramp up uh, in Cisco's revenues. And Cisco was viewed to be the powerhouse of the internet revolution, basically selling all the servers and all the equipment that would enable the growth of the internet. Not unlike perhaps the view of NVIDIA today as the powerhouse to enable the AI revolution, however real or, or puffed up that is. But you can see here, Cisco obviously had very strong revenue growth and it's continued frankly, uh, maybe not at the same pace, but uh, the company has continued to generate revenue growth. Obviously, there's been a, a period of stagnation here from about uh, 2013 through you know just about a year ago, but the stock price uh, absolutely cratered. It was up at $80 a share, collapsed to as low as about $8 a share in, in 2003. And it's still today, nowhere near where it was at its pinnacle in 2000. Not trying to make a forecast here in NVIDIA, but it is a perhaps a, a very instrumental analog to highlight the the how even great and fast growing companies um, can be horrible investments because the price share price the prices of the shares has risen so dramatically higher to to not even come close to justify the the, the growth that that is um, embedded into the stock. Um, you know that's about it I, I wanted to share this week. Uh, we we've been very very busy obviously we um, we want these videos to, to be helpful updates to you and, and uh, on things that we're seeing and watching. But uh, we always um, invite one-to-one uh, -one conversations with clients. Our whole team uh, is here to serve you. And um, as I said, here it is, uh, August 24th. Summer's getting short in the tooth here. And uh, you know, we really hope that you all can enjoy some pleasant days uh, uh, here in late summer as we lead into the uh, Labor Day holiday. Uh, but that's about it for this week, and uh, we'll be back next week with a, with another uh, weekly update video. And I um, want to thank you for watching, and I uh, hope you all have a great day. Bye now.